Today I'm going to read to you from 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 to 17. 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 17. And once everyone's there, we'll read God's Word. All right, God's Word says, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And know, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Chapter 3 of 2 Timothy begins with a warning of how the world's going to be in the last days. It tells of godlessness, people who are going to love themselves, are going to love money, are going to be boastful, proud, and abusive. They're going to be disobedient, ungrateful, unholy, without love. They're going to be unforgiving. They're going to be slanderous. They're going to be without self-control. They're going to be brutal, treacherous, rash, and conceited. Any of these things ring a bell? We live in a time when we see so many things happening and the world becoming more and more hostile toward the Christian faith. And many may find it tempting to break away from the faith and follow the world's lead, to avoid any stress, to avoid any hardship, to keep away from ridicule, to keep away from persecution. Sadly, a lot of people are going to choose the path of the world because it's the easy road to take. Paul, after he talked about these end times and how the people were going to be, he then focuses chapter 3 back to Timothy. And he writes to Timothy, beginning in verse 10, stating, Now, all of this stuff may happen, but he says, But you know all about my teaching and my way of life. That was from verse verse 10 to 11. Tells us about that it says, You know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. Okay, now if you want to hear more about his persecution in detail, Acts chapter 13 verse 50 gives us a a clue as to what happened in Antioch. And that is 13 verse 50 of Acts. It says, But the Jews incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So the people who didn't like what he was saying went and stirred up the crowd and turned the crowd against them and had them kicked out of the region. And in 2 Corinthians 11, 25 to 27, that's another verse if you want to read some more about his persecution he had to endure. Now in verse 12, we come to these words. 
And these are words we need to listen to. Because it's not words we want to hear, but these are words that Paul's speaking the truth. What does he say in verse 12? He says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He doesn't say they may be. He doesn't say it's possible. He says they will be persecuted. Now let's think about the time frame of this letter. This is sometime in likely the 60s A.D. And it was just about this time when the Romans started to take notice of the Christian faith and they started to treat the Christians not so well. And so Paul was being persecuted by the Jews themselves because they did not accept the message of Christ. And now the Roman Empire was going to take notice of that. But Paul is saying, if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to be persecuted. Now, let's think about us doing evangelism in our time. If you want to go to someone and share the gospel with them and say, oh, by the way, if you accept this, you're going to be persecuted. That's not a very good selling point, is it? Think about Paul in that time. The, the, the locals are seeing how the Christians are being treated. And Paul's preaching the gospel and saying, yep, you want to follow Christ, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to have to endure all these hard things. Don't you want to do that too? But you know what? Maybe it's not such a hard selling point. Why would someone want to accept that lifestyle? Why would someone want to follow Christ and deal with all these persecutions? Well, the answer may be simpler than you think. And what's the answer? The answer is because it's true. Anyone is willing to endure whatever for the truth. Now if we see about how all the disciples of Jesus lost their life, many of them brutally lost their life. Not one of them ever recanted their story. Not one of them ever said, you know what, you're right, I'll just denounce Jesus so I can keep my life. They stood firm to the message of the gospel. And why? Because it's true. They would not have done that for a lie. They did it because it's true. Now, Paul encourages Timothy by not only here citing his own persecutions. Now he could have just said, well, I've done through this, 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 and this. Paul, or Timothy, you can do it. That's not all he said, though. He didn't just cite his persecutions, he went a little further and cited his rescue from them. <coughs> and drink of water, excuse me. His rescue from them. He talks about Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. And I want to look to Psalm 34, verse 19. Because this was an inspiration for Paul. Psalm 34, 19, which says, A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Paul wanted Timothy to understand, no matter what this world's going to put you through, no matter what hardship you're going to face, God will see you through. So don't lose heart. Don't. Get cold feet. 
be bold for the truth of the gospel because the Lord will get you through whatever hardship is coming your way. He wants Timothy to understand that there's absolutely nothing so bad that the Lord cannot rescue him from it. He wants Timothy to be faithful. So the question one must ask then is this. We're talking about being faithful to the message. So, how can one stay true to the faith? How can one stay true to the faith? Well, first of all, we have to be clear on this point. Spiritual faithfulness in the past is going to be no guarantee that that person is going to be faithful in the future. No, let's think about it. If things are going good, it's easy to stay here. But when things start getting all messed up and getting difficult, sometimes we don't want to stay here anymore. We want to move over here. So, understanding that faithfulness in the past is no guarantee of faithfulness in the future, now we've got to realize faithfulness in the future requires... First of all, that one recognize and follow examples of faithfulness in Scripture. To be spiritually faithful, we must learn to recognize God's examples for us to follow. Okay, so how do we recognize the godly examples? Well, the first thing we need to look for, a godly example is someone who is known for their teaching. Paul would be a godly example. Paul taught God's word. Jesus is obviously a godly example. Those are ones we need to look to to see how we should follow, how we should be faithful. Next, a godly example is known for their character. Now, we're not talking about a Pixar image. We're not talking about Looney Tunes characters. Talking about how the person is, how they are in their lives, their character, how they, are, what about their conduct, their purpose in doing things, the faith that they exhibit in how they live their lives, the patience that they have toward others, the love they exhibit toward others, and the way that they persevere through trials. That is the character of a godly example. Next, a godly example is known for having a godly demeanor. And not just a godly demeanor, a godly demeanor under trials. That one is probably the most difficult for a godly example to do because even the best of us, when we're under pressure, when we're under trials, a lot of times we get stressed and when we get stressed, we start being not so nice. It shows. We start to act differently because of all the stress and all the hardship that we're going through. It affects us. But a godly example, a godly example will show us that godly demeanor even through the trials. They're going to still show love. They're going to still show mercy and compassion. They're going to still have that faith. They're going to persevere. They're going to be patient. It's very difficult when the flesh tries to lead us in the opposite direction. But to have a godly demeanor is to exhibit these things even under the harshest of circumstances. Think about Paul and Silas when they were in prison. They could have been all panicked and all upset and all stressed. But what did they do? They sang... Psalms and spiritual songs in the prison, praising God in their bondage. That's a spiritual demeanor. That's a godly demeanor. Now, being spiritually faithful, as we're talking about, also means learn how to follow godly examples. It's one thing to be able to recognize these godly examples that we've just talked about. It's an absolutely, completely different thing to follow them. So how do we follow godly examples? First of all, we follow closely. We understand and we embrace godly living. 
Many of us enjoy worldly pleasures. And worldly pleasures, while not sinful on their own sometimes, they can lead to sinful behavior, sinful obsessions. They can lead to wanting to be somewhere else rather than be in worship. Embracing godly living means to follow God's word and to live according to God's word. To be spiritually faithful, following godly example means to also to develop strong Christian convictions. We can't be godly if we follow what the world says is right versus what God's word says is right. Godly convictions means to stand for everything that's in God's Word. Now, there are individuals out there who will say they're godly, but what do they do? They go through here and they go, oh, well, this doesn't apply, this doesn't apply. They cherry-pick the Scripture so that they follow what they like and they ignore what they don't like. That's not a godly example. Anyone can look through Scripture and find what they like Say, oh, I'm okay with that, but not this. <coughs> so to follow godly example is to develop strong Christian convictions and to not compromise those convictions to try to be more accommodating to those who don't follow the same convictions. Next is to continue in convictions even when under fire. This is difficult because a lot of us can stand for our faith when everything's going well. But when things are not going well, sometimes people have a tendency to go against it to try to spare themselves from suffering. Think of Peter on the night Jesus was arrested as an example of that. He said he didn't know Jesus in an attempt to try to save himself because he was afraid. That's how we can be too. Now remember what Paul said in verse 12. Everyone who wants to live a godly life and be a true believer and disciple of Christ, they will be persecuted. They will be persecuted. And Paul then leaves Timothy in verse 16 with attributes of Scripture. These are the attributes of God's Word. And what does he say these attributes are? He says, first of all, all Scripture is what? It's God-breathed. It's the Word of God. God spoke this. It was written down. It's God's Word. It's God-breathed. Secondly, all Scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, Correcting and training. We use God's word to teach people about the faith, to teach people how they should be. We use God's word to rebuke others. Now, we don't bring judgment upon them, but when we see that they're not living according to what Scripture says, we can politely rebuke them and lead them in the right path. Next, it's good for correcting, which is the same kind of thing. Say, hey, you know, maybe this isn't the right way you should be going. God's Word says this. Let me help you go this way so you can maybe do what you need to do next time. We should never, however, be judgmental and condemning toward anyone because having a judgmental and condemning attitude towards someone is not going to lead them to Christ. It's going to push them away. And next for training. We use God's Word to train people in the faith. That's discipleship. That's what it means to do discipleship. When someone comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then the leaders in the church, it's their job to take that person and disciple them in the faith. To instruct them and teach them according to God's Word and how they should be, how they should act, what they should do. So what are these attributes of Scripture to do in our lives? Paul says it. They will thoroughly equip us for every good 
work. We can't go out and do evangelism. We can't go out and, and try to live God's word if we don't have these attributes of Scripture in our lives. If we don't believe these things. If we're not instructed in the word, we're not going to be prepared for a gospel conversation with somebody. We have to have all these things going on in order to be thoroughly equipped to do good works. Now, Paul warns that there's going to be evil ones. There's going to be imposters. There's going to be deceivers, and they're going to go from bad to worse. And all we've got to do is look at the world just in our lifetime and see that's true. Everything's gone from bad to worse. So how do we as believers then keep from falling away from our faith in the face of all this that's going on around us? Well, the first thing we need to be aware of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. And 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 to 9 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. So we keep alert. We make sure that we know what's going on. And we know how we should be living. And so we don't get caught off guard and get led astray by the lion looking around for something to devour. And that lion will devour you if he gets a chance to. But if we're alert... We're not going to be caught off guard. Now we're in our church on Wednesday nights. We're doing a study. We're watching Matt Chandler's study on Revelation. And one thing he mentioned in this study in the last episode, he was talking our relationship with God is like the current of a river. And he's saying there's no way that we can get closer to God if we get pulled downstream by the world. See, the world is the, stri- is the current that's pushing away from God, and God may be at the head of the river. And if we're here and the current's pushing us away, we've got to constantly try to swim upstream to get closer to God. We can't just stay in the river and expect to stay closer to God because we're going to get farther and farther away, and eventually we're going to be way over here. So how do we stay over here and not drift this way we have to continually study scripture we have to pray we have to fight against that current to get closer to God we have to follow these godly examples have these convictions within our lives now today in our world we're witnessing major major persecution of believers maybe not so much in this country but immediate context Afghanistan The Taliban has sent messages, text messages and letters to Christians saying, we know where you are and we're coming after you. And when ISIS was big, remember the Coptic Christians in Egypt, they kidnapped them out of the church, took them out, cut their heads off for being Christian. The Chinese believers are undergoing major persecution in China for their faith. In the time of Revelation, the Christians endured persecution we can't even imagine today. Being fed to wild animals, being set on fire while they're still alive as torches. Horrible atrocities committed against Christians. So how are we then with our faith? If we see these other people willing to suffer and die for their faith, how are we with our faith? How are we with our convictions? Now, it's relatively easy in our society to live our faith because, relatively speaking, we don't endure a lot of persecution for our faith, at least not yet. But how would we as believers stand up against the Taliban or ISIS? Or in communist China. 
or in the Muslim world where it's a crime to be a Christian? How would we stand for our faith in those conditions? Would we be as bold as the Afghan Christians are? Or would we cave under the pressure? Now, I'm sure we'd all like to stand here and say, there's no way we would ever denounce our faith. There's no way we would ever cave under the pressure and try to save our life. Because we're Christians, we are saved. But I guarantee you there are some out there who wouldn't be so strong. I only hope that all of us would be. But unless we're actually faced with that situation, we don't know for sure. But let's look to our Christian brothers and sisters who are dying every day for their faith and draw inspiration from them, the strength that we would need to stand for our faith if we were in that situation. Paul led by example through his experiences. And we must find hope through his experiences. Hope and faith that God's going to be with us through every situation. Now, yes, we may suffer persecution and we may die. We may have natural disaster come through and lose our life. A virus may kill us. We may be in a car wreck and lose our life. Sometimes things happen and we think it's not fair because that person was a believer. Why would God take them out? God didn't take them out. God is not responsible for evil. Satan is responsible for evil. And Satan's evil is in the world. Sin is in the world. It's not God's fault. It's not even Satan's fault. It's our fault because Adam and Eve gave in to temptation and ate the fruit. So bad things happen because evil exists. But that doesn't mean that God is not with us through those things. God will be with us through every situation even when we lose our life. Think about Stephen. When Stephen was being stoned to death, right before he died, what did he see? He looked up and he saw heaven open and he saw the Lord. God was with Stephen even as he died. And God will be with us as we die, regardless of how it happens. But we must stay true As Paul encouraged Timothy to do, stay true to your faith. Stay true. You see what's happened to me. God's got me through it. God will get you through it too. Stay true. And as believers, we are called to serve. We are called to be the light in the dark world. We must stand firm and be true to God's word in all things, regardless of what the world will do to us. What does Scripture tell us? It says, do not fear those who can take the body, but not the soul. Be more fearful of the ones who can take the soul. As a believer, yeah, the world may take our physical life from us, but they can't take our soul. They can't take our spirit. Our spirit belongs to God. And we should know that in the moment of our death, we're immediately in the presence of the Lord. There should be some comfort in that and some elimination of the fear of death for believers. We must stand firm. Now, without faith, without that faith that Paul talks about, without all these convictions that we've talked about today, without these examples to follow... The world will devour us. The world will laugh at us and make fun of us and and say, I can destroy those people. They're not strong. They don't even really believe what they say they believe. And how can you truly believe something if you don't live it? How can you truly believe something if you don't study it, if you don't want to know more about it? 
Do we have true faith if we never read scripture, if we never pray, if we never attend worship? We need these things. We need our church family to stand together and help us to stand firm, to, to encourage each other, to embolden each other, to rebuke each other, to correct each other, to instruct each other. Without these things, that lion that's prowling around sees right prey right there for the taking. So what must we do to have this kind of faith? Well, first and foremost, you can't have the faith without knowing Jesus Christ. The first thing is to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. See, He came to the world to die for our sins. And we must accept that sacrifice for Him to be Lord and Savior of our life. And if we truly believe God's word, there's no way that we can't accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because that's what God's word says. He stands there ready to invite everyone in. He gave his life up on the cross for everybody. So that if we would just believe in him, we would have eternal life through his death and resurrection. It's a message for all people across all time to surrender control of their life and give it over to God. To invite Jesus Christ into our hearts and be Lord and Savior of our lives. So if you've listened to this message and, and you're struggling with having this faith or the strength that you need to stand firm, or if you would like to know how Paul was able to go through these things and endure it, Jesus Christ is the answer. So in a moment we're going to pray, and as we pray, we'll first pray to lead you through accepting Jesus Christ. And for those who have already accepted Him, we'll pray for every one of us. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I know I'm a sinner, Lord, and I know that I've made mistakes in my life. I know that I don't deserve you. I know I don't deserve anything. But I do believe that you are God, and I do believe you came into the world, Lord, to, to give your life up for our sin, for my sin. To die in my place on the cross, a death I deserve for my sin, but a death you did not deserve. And through your death and resurrection, Lord, I believe you conquered death, I believe you conquered sin. And I invite you to come into my heart and be Lord and Savior of my life, Lord, I ask you forgive me of my sins. I turn away from sin. I repent of my sin. I surrender control of my life to you. And I dedicate myself to being your faithful disciple. And Lord, for those of us who are believers, help us to focus on Paul's example of how to endure all the hardships in this life and stay faithful to our belief in you, to stay true to our faith, Help us, Lord, to be bold, to stand for our faith, bold to share our faith with others so that others may see the truth of the gospel through how we live our lives. You know, in Scripture, Lord, you said, whoever tries to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will have eternal life. Help us to keep that in mind. Should we ever be in a situation where our life is threatened for our faith to know that they may take our body but we will be forever in your presence all this we ask in your name lord jesus christ amen